you so. Um, there are two opposite directions, fashions of, of uh, simulating this. Uh, one is the creation and another is evolution. Mm -hmm. So if you want to process evolution, you, you don't need to change anything, you just run normalized molecular dynamics for eternally long, expect until you fetch. Uh, I don't know about Russell, but Braden selected uh, research methodology inspired by creation. He creates specific initial momentum so that the reaction bumps into catalyst input. It's, it's uh, somewhat larger amount of work, but uh, higher chance of success. Approach him from behind and go for it. It depends who we are and what we do. Oh, have you done your tasks? Yeah, months ago. Months ago? Months. He was so relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as soon as I got my W2, I did mine. It's still half of a day. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Braden's doing that right now because I know he said he still has to do his. I don't actually know. I'm, I'm waiting for like to respond. Like <laughs> the first time I did my taxes, I um, waited <coughs> until like the last week of course because I didn't think anything of it. <coughs> but the government had my birthday wrong. Huh? The government had my birthday wrong, so I had to go into the, like the, the whatever it is in downtown St. Paul and. Fix it because they have my birthday right. <laughs> oh man. Is it fixed now or are you still? You can celebrate it twice. But... <laughs> <laughs> there was just a day off, but like it was enough that they wouldn't accept anything. So. That's a one case, so you could get an extension on your taxes. Yeah, I mean, form. I had it done. Like, I got it done still. So, like, that ended up being okay. But it was just like, I was so confused. I thought I messed up. So this is why we follow Europe and how they do taxes. They basically just send you a form and you basically say, Oh, yep, Switzerland. Switzerland does that. <laughs> they they do all your taxes and they'll send you a form and then you will look it over and if there's something that you need to change, you just change that mm -hmm. and resend it to them. If there's nothing to change, you just reset it and that's you're done. That's so smart because people yeah. are way too dumb. You, right. you watch the Adam runs everything on that? What's up? Adam ruins everything. Did that? Adam watched. Um, he was talking about the whole system and why we don't do it that way is because of lobbyists. Tax because that. tax firms make so much money off, of, or not the accounting firms make so much money off of taxes that why would you start doing that? You lose billions of dollars. So they lobbied. So. Our main goal is to complete research projects and to do decent reports that will uh, eventually serve as seeds for papers that you need for a successful career. Um, and in the lecture time, you just relax and time with you. With something related to the course. So what I'm going to tell is related to TDDFT, which is important for your uh, academic career, but you can survive in the course without running in the single time. <laughs> um, when you may need TDDFT and how to run it, this, this is five minutes thing. You just, uh, in the Gaussian, you select TD instead of ground state, and you uh, select number of Excitations that you want to cover. And then you just submit a job. And then uh, there are scripts that on one of the remaining labs I will share to extract things that we do need for what is the goal of TDFT? Oscillation. Yes, and? Density matrix. Absorption. Global correct, but uh, and in order to get absorption, you need oscillator strengths and transition and dipole 
Neurologist. Die for. So, uh, the, when you run TGVT, it, it does generate transition energies and oscillator strength for each transition. Right? And, and you do spectrum and become happy. But uh, the theory is hard and it is worth of, uh, learning so that if you ever include it into your research, you will know how to explain it in the methodology section of the paper. In this course, in the, where is, where is, can't write the TDDFT, but if you want to include it, you may run it. When you characterize before and after reaction of thermal motion, so you can take your molecule and run TDDFT and, and look how the spectrum looks like. And uh, if TDDFT spectrum di differs from your independent orbital approximation that you do in BASP, it means that independent orbital approximation is bad. If it coincides, it means that uh, independent orbital approximation is bad. In many practical cases, the spectra computed by these two methods look the same in the shape, but they are offset by the certain energy. So TDFT gives a typical small transition. So it's not a rule of thumb, but it is normal. You get uh, excitation energy less than just uh, energy of uh, So this is all stuff. So we can go find the thing with space and all using amplification. <laughs> I was doing taxes and uh, a quarter of a proposal and well, it was only uh, half an hour for the slides. Okay. <coughs> stop. Whom? Oh, stop here, probably. <laughs> it looks like stop me. Stop <laughs> <laughs> me. Stop me from talking. Stop me. Okay. So, um, ideally, this course was uh, originally designed as extremely higher top level of the graduate curriculum. So you learn everything and only then this course. But there is no reason because all practical things that we do in the lab do not need any, any of uh, complicated things. You can, you can learn, learn them quickly. But there is one concept that uh, uh, those who are in physics may have heard about and those who are in chemistry may or may not be exposed. So, um, if you were, or if you will, be in Chem 1, uh, you will learn that there is quantum theory, there are different potentials, different models. Now, here, we have very complicated and they are not possible to solve analytically. But there, there is a like handful amount of problems that uh, quantum problems that can be solved analytically. Like, uh, hydrogen atom is the most complicated one. There is like box, free space, uh, rotator. What else? That's it. Free space, box, rotator, oscillator, hydrogen atom. Right? So there, there are only the five problems that you can solve exactly. All other problems are so approximate to this certain level of, of, of accuracy. And right now, in this course, we do have programs, scripts, software that solves uh, problems for us when it's in your state. But uh, if, you, if you would do it before, like, 1965, most likely we will never see uh, computer facilities in, in, uh, in our life, and if you need to do science and compute something, it means compact or pen and paper equations. So there are approaches that allow to find approximate solutions when the exact solution is not available. And one of, uh, of this class of um, tools is known as perturbation theory, where you compose 
your you can represent your problem as a exactly solvable one plus little addition, little perturbation. And uh, there is a theory similar to Taylor series in, in uh, uh, idea that you can get orders of corrections that bring you closer and closer to reference. You can look without it, but later on you may you may see. It. So T D D F T is implementation of such theory. Uh, there are at least two brands of perturbation. Time independent and time dependent. Same actually implementation. And TDFT originates from time dependent perturbation theory. I don't know if questions in legal. Probably not. Um, so solution without perturbation and correction plus many, many orders of correction. And when we focus only on the correction that brings us further to correction. Time dependent means that perturbation is not in the shape of potential, but from external oscillating field, oscillating or some other time dependent field. So and the correction used to be this boy. Your success in the So uh, this perturbation depends on the um, eigenstates of, uh, of the absence of perturbation times uh, frequency of uh, oscillating factor from external field and times unknown coefficients. So there are coefficients that tell how much each of the basis states is perturbed due to external oscillating field. So it was a summary of, of the future. So, how does it project onto our molecule that is being exposed to oscillating electric field? A molecule that we have already described with ground state density function. So we do have on one we do have two things that we may want to connect. One thing is Hamiltonian that is composed of unperturbed Hamiltonian when the molecule is standalone without any lasers flying around, plus low intensity field. Zero, which is time independent, plus H prime, which is because of the oscillating field. And uh, uh, absolute value of this H prime is assumed to be much smaller than absolute value of H zero. So due to, which, which means that your electrons sit around your ions, but due to oscillating electric field, they are, are either collectively oscillate as you see in plasmonics, plasmonic metal particles, or they experience transition to excited states. But very small fraction of overall electron density. So the question is to see the response of electron density to this external electric field. And there is an expectation that uh, if we expose our molecule to electric field, there will be overall density will be composed of whatever was before perturbation, plus a little part, this one is, needs to be small, that will oscillate with the same frequency as incident field. Because all other frequencies will, will relax with time. And if this is infinite, started uh, infinite time ago, it goes on infinitely forward. So CW oxidation. Um, 
contribution, little contribution to the oral test. Okay. Don't appeal to your scientific intuition, especially if you did run TDDFT. One, one way, Alisa? Anyone else? Okay. There you go. So, and everyone who did spectroscopy, do molecules respond to any frequency? Or they have some favorite frequencies at which they absorb light? They have certain frequencies. Yes. So the change of the density in our density function framework is so this little, little induced change of the density will depend on frequency. Okay? So if you want to literally follow what happens to density, it will be time dependent. But if you want to see amplitude of this time dependent thing, it will it will be higher if it is resonant excitation and it was small with offer. So the actual thing that we need to find is not time dependent by but frequency dependent. So in some sense, we need to find transition density as function of incident light frequency. Okay. Why? Why we are not happy? Why we need to find it? We, we are skipping a, a lot of derivations. This is beautiful theory that many people like to derive, but it would take ten lectures <laughs> to go over, over details. So why do we need the density? Oh, I agree. We do need those frequencies at which this density maximizes. Right? If you scan the frequency, this density will, uh, as function frequency will. At peaks, and we need this frequency as as resonance. But why why we need it? Um, this transition density will be an intermediate quantity to compute oscillator strengths for transition at given frequency. So we we needed four oscillator strengths. Four oscillator. And we also need to check which of these frequencies will be resonant. Okay. So what were we doing last time? Number. And I skipped the detailed uh, review. What do you remember from Thursday meeting, if you remember anything? That's fine. <laughs> it's so long ago. Any of you went to board deriving something? It's my favorite. Otherwise, you would remember something. Um, anything that surprised you by being too short or too expanded? Any matrices? We talked about the density matrix. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you, you remember something. You just pretend that you do. <laughs> <laughs> so the density matrix is the set of coefficients that convert orbitals. Density for a given orbital into density of overall uh, electrons in the whole system, right? Uh, coefficients at which pair of orbitals contribute to the overall density, and uh, the uh, we can split it on uh, four segments: the one corresponding to occupied at zero at originally, the one that corresponds to originally unoccupied and transition density. And uh, we got some arguments that uh, at lowest order we need only the transition density. So the GDDFT theory tells how this transition densities can be found if we know something about the incident light. So how to find ability to your molecule correspond to the incident light. And um, 
the uh, transition densities are stored in form of the vector. And uh, if you skip several meetings of, of derivations, there is an eigenstate equation that uh, if, if it is solved, it generates eigenvalues corresponding to transition energies and uh, eigenvectors corresponding to transition densities. Variables and values. Energies. Formula set eigen vectors. Transition basis. X sub i y. No one objects. Means everyone supports. So, although you can survive without TGDT, you would feel much better if it is in your baggage. And practical aspects of running TGDT calculation is very simple and minor. You, you don't need this course to, to run. But in order to discuss it and defend your findings uh, uh, against uh, reviewers or aggressive attendees of your poster or oral presentation, you may have some ideas how it works and what it rep represents. So um, I am talking about nothing except TDDFT, but it is very rich area. It is uh, heavier than the, the whole course bef before it. So uh, let me approach it from one specific aspect. How do we think about excitations? What is excitation? So, um, before, up to now, we were speaking in the, let me find this highlighter to be thicker, orbital, orbital representation. There will be alternative so for x representation. So, in our career in this course, we used to have highest occupied, highest occupied minus one, lowest unoccupied, lowest unoccupied plus one, and, and many other states, right? And then we used to have this energy. energy. We used to have transitions. So first excitation uh, has energy of orbital energy of Lumo minus the energy of Co, right? Second excitation, as, as it is drawn here, can be energy of Lumo minus energy of Homo minus one. Right? Pair of orbitals. The first, second, third one, no, no, third one will be here. From energy Lumo plus one minus energy Homo. Okay? And the last one available if we do not draw more orbitals, number four will be energy Lumo plus one, minus energy, homo minus one, right? So you have four transitions. Two occupied orbitals, two unoccupied orbitals, two times two, two times two, two times two equals four. Consistent picture, everything is clear. Listen, does this picture agrees with TDFT. Daniel, does this picture agrees with TDFT? 
what you see when you calculate it and when you draw the spectrum. Can I ask you what it is? Yes, very good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, you can tell where it's going in the uh, Yes, yes, it, it, it tells transition energy. It doesn't yeah. tell where it comes from. Yeah. It, it gives only excitation number one, excitation number two. So in the TDDFT output, you do not have source and final. Your source is always ground state. Ground state. And then, which is assumed that it does exist. And then you have excitation number one, excitation number two, excitation number three, excitation number four. So the excitation number one is just going from ground to first excitation without specifics which or there is a big uh, background hidden stored information how it can be composed of orbitals but it is not the major uh, form of output and from the point of view of thinking about spectra if you if you do experiment of, of recording absorption spectra you do not need to know about orbitals you just know there objectively there is a transition of given energy with such intensity that's it But now you, you know that there is a correspondence. First, transition can be transition from lowest, uh, highest occupied and lowest unoccupied. The second transition will be whatever we call it, from home minus one to home. Third, and fourth, right? So I do not know how to verbalize it in a, in a nice language, but if you are describing your system in the language of TDFT or any other excited state theory, you do not have uh, orbitals, so uh, initial and final. You have just standalone excitations. And uh, this is excitonic picture, and uh, this is considered to be more general, more applicable, and uh, you, um, I will be very happy and uh, consider this course successful if, when you find an aggressive reviewer or visitor to a poster, you will not be scared by uh, transitions between these two representations. So uh, sometimes you and your reviewer may speak on different languages, like you speak on pairs of orbitals and the reviewer speaks about excitations or otherwise. So. Um, I hope this figure helps you to make connection and do transitions, translations between these two figures at the conceptual language. When we will go forward in this TDFT theory, um, and when you will practically run it, like two of you are running it every day or every week, you can see that for each Transition, there is a record of excitation energy, oscillator strength, and then there are pairs of orbitals that contribute to given transition. So main difference of excited state theory is that given resonant frequency, resonant transition, is contributed by more than one elementary pairs of electron and hole. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but at least this opportunity is there. I don't know about you, you look exhausted, but I'm very happy. This is, uh, I think, really a good summary. Yes. So, very approximately, deep energy difference in orbital picture corresponds to excitation energy of the first, second, third. If any of these orbitals are degenerate or nearly degenerate, it will, it will corrupt this approximate relation. So it is only to have a systematic view on, on this translation. Yes, so in real world, our orbitals do have degenerate Cs. Yes. So what exactly do we do differently when we have degenerate C that works? I already told you a story about Oregon and a uh, fine lady who served as a secretary 
corrupting my, my English. <laughs> Did I? Huh? <coughs> or maybe not, not or you were not, not a, you either forgot or I forgot or to tell <laughs> or someone was not here. I, I will answer a question, I remember. Once I was a postdoc in Oregon and I was not feeling myself uh, comfortable in uh, especially writing English, and I was seeking opportunity to get corrections to whatever I read, like abstract conference. And there was a very friendly, fine lady from maybe high society who served as a secretary to the, to the institute. And I was like, would you please help? And she said, oh, yeah. And then she, she was very polite and didn't know how to tell it. She said, you know, it's generally good, but there are some words that are not used in society, community, what? Did I use that name? <laughs> the wrong words? And, and she, she, she was like hesitant, like, no, uh, some words mean bad things. Like, what? It means people who are not, not intellectually strong. Like, what? <laughs> Energy states are degenerate. <laughs> <laughs> Colin McKibbick, if you're watching this video, it is about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if you have de degeneracy, then um, you you don't have just many many of this of these transitions, and they will be lined up one of one after another. But um, the there are discussions in the community that superposition and simultaneous uh, um, cooperative, constructive addition of, of several elementary transitions is uh, somewhat different from true excited states when, which represent interaction between uh, electrons and holes. So in addition to um, just including several elementary transitions in uh, in one resonant state, the TGFT theory, as we will see in a couple of slides, has specific tools to take into account interaction between uh, electrons and holes and formation of bound excitons. Therefore, energy of excitation is typically smaller in this TGFT than uh, energy orbital difference of, of the same system with the same function. So here is one of the main achievements of human civilization. It, it was not uh, yet awarded, but uh, it is uh, really a really strong thing. And we are missing pleasure of deriving this equation. But we just get getting acquainted, same as uh, Alice in Wonderland. Like padding, this is this is class class. This is equation. So this equation has form of eigenstate uh, eigenstate equation. So some metric, some vector, some uh, eigenvalue. So upon solution, one is getting the eigen vector and eigenvalues, and eigenvalues are excitation energies, and eigenvectors are transition densities. There are so many of those. We need some index that's different from orbital dimensions. I know you can use Greek or capital. So instead of two indices for source and uh, final orbitals, we will have just uh, h bar omega capital. So we just count excitations, not pairs of orbitals. And for each uh, pair of orbitals, for each excitation, there is a transition density. Transition density is needed in this purpose to find oscillator strengths. Okay. What else? Do you have any questions? Or just staring. Just na naturally, there, there is no trap and trick in the question. We have already introduced. What is x? What is y? What is omega? You know from yourself uh, what is zero and what is one. 
other any other symbols that you do not know in this situation. Any letters that I'm due for you? The A and the B. Yes. So what is A and what is B? I'm also curious. Huh? Um, well, let me let me just bring it up. <laughs> so. If you solve this equation in absence of electron hole interaction, of, of absence of any Coulomb interaction, and, uh, in order to solve this equation, you, you need to solve it on the top of successful solution of ground state based functional theory. So if the, um, any of the um, Exchange correlation and Coulomb are absent. I'm removing them, but they, they are not zero in real life. Then the only non zero term will be this uh, occupied uh, and unoccupied pairs of ordinals. So upon solving this equation formula, it will be a trivial solution. You will get excitation energy equals to energy difference of pair of ordinals. Okay, a trivial solution. But if uh, the electron hole or general hole, any forms of hole interaction are present, it will be changed to excitation energy and to the transition transition density. So you remember this notation. Um, Christian was attending this meeting in Fatima was attending so it was on the break on the Senegal conference in the lobby oh, boy, when we uh, excuse me, I'm there oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, how can I forget I have no idea <laughs> so what, what do this how can you check what do this notation mean okay, well, no, no, I'll be there <laughs> <laughs> so it is uh, Coulomb interaction. Uh, you know, it includes uh, four orbitals, right? If it is just charge to charge, then two pairs of orbitals coincide. But generally, there are four that may not coincide. First, second, third, fourth. So it's uh, Coulomb interaction. And if two would be coincide, like I I A A, it will be just Coulomb attraction uh, or repulsion between. Uh, electron localized on orbital i and orbital a, right? Uh, if the indices are not coincide, it is exotic things of this uh, uh, exchange, which has negative energy and stabilizes uh, chemical molecule, right? So um, x stands for exchange, and. The letter C stands for London Master Number because he was running around in the center of the class. X equals exchange. And C equals correlation. So different forms of uh, of um, <laughs> actually, Alyssa, you, you shouldn't decline your presence. You could tell, like, look at the next line. <laughs> <laughs> See, <coughs> 1 over delta r is Coulomb, and here are 4 orbitals. <laughs> so, um, different forms of uh, Coulomb uh, interaction are entering this uh, indices A, A and B. And they are responsible for electrons and holes attracting and forming particles. And since we are doing TDD, density functional theory, family of, of theories, we do not compute this Coulomb integrals literally. Instead, we can take them as 
functional derivative of the functional in respect to variation of this. And this trick allows this calculation to be somewhat quick and somewhat precise. Enough? More or less. Uh, occupy unoccupied. If, if, you do, if you have steam for this thing, we can return to it and devote more time or do quiz or exam or derivation. I doubt that you want it. <laughs> so, conceptual. This um, omega sub i is transition energies. Transition energy. But we also get transition density. I was promising you that transition density helps you to find what? I think that is needed to plot spectrum. Oscillator strength? Yes. So um, the transition density allows to find oscillator strength. Do you believe it? Or maybe you want to be, but you do not see connection. Does, does it sound natural to you, or not, not quite? Yeah. Uh, how do you find oscillator strength in, uh, in your past time? You, you find oscillator strength through transition dipole, right? Ij equals orbital. Ah, this is a bad slide. Phi sub i, r, phi sub j, or sometimes you use the letter p, right? And then uh, transition dipole, uh, absolute value squared gives us the strengths. Objections? No. Mm. Mm. Yes. J proportional d and j. It is very close to the favorite subject of Han. Who loves the equation? Who loves the equation? Right. <laughs> but now we do not have we do not have orbitals. So T T T doesn't generate orbitals. It uses them as an input, but it doesn't give them out. Well, I'm not lying, but uh, I'm simplifying. There is a procedure that allows to interpret and convert TDDFT results in form of orbitals. This is called NTO, and you, uh, those who wait, may even know practically how to do it. But no one knows how to do it. Like but NTOs, natural transition orbitals, they are just way to interpret TDDFT results. It is not the outcome of the calculation. The outcome of calculation are only densities. And now we have question how to find observable the uh, transition dipole based on the density. So uh, I have a question based on that. What's the difference between a hoto and a homo? Like a huh? What's the difference like a hoto and a homo and a ludo and a lumo? So um, So instead of MO molecular orbitals, it is TO transition orbital. So there is a way to decompose density transition density back to single pair of orbitals in such way, in such pair of orbitals that would give the same transition density. The transition orbitals are not absurd. They are even stronger abstraction than function. But uh, the densities, if you want to project them onto um, transition density, if, if you want to project them into Cartesian space, they are six dimensional. They depending on uh, vector one, vector two. And six dimensional things are a little challenging for human to visualize. Therefore, just to simplify visualization, there is a procedure of decomposing transition density onto pair of orbitals, hot and ludo. 
but they are not observables and they are only true for interpretation. No? Yes. So, how to convert transition density into oscillator strength? Observe. Expectation value is equal to initial orbital operator, final orbital. Or alternative, it is equal, equals to <laughs> trace of the density operator times operator of observable. If you do not believe this equation, look back to your PCM1 if you took it. Look forward to your PCM1 if you plan to take it. Uh, but the, there is an alternative way of finding expectation value of any observable. Instead of taking sandwich between initial and final orbital, one can take a density operator, multiply it uh, by operator of circle, and take trace. This is product of two matrices, and trace is the sum of all of the elements along the diagonal of, uh, yes. of the argument. Yes, yes. So if the operators are represented in matrix form, trace is the sum of, of diagonal elements. This, uh, I just skipped derivation of this uh, statement because it is very, very uh, general and uh, just do them. It's correct. They, they are identical. Now, since uh, J are familiar, he is familiar with the concept of trace, you are invited to work <laughs> to teach us a little example. Yes. <laughs> So what are we going to see here? Uh, the transition density is uh, reduced only to, well, overall density matrix is reduced only to um, elements in the vicinity of frontier orbitals. So occupied, unoccupied, and uh, transition density matrix is represented only by one element and one conjugated element, right? So much simpler, only the little, uh, Square. Now, the transition density operator, the transition transition dipole operator, uh, has nothing on main diagonal and uh, is non-zero on the off diagonal. So the task of the uh, is to multiply these two very complicated matrices and then take trace of them. Can you comment what, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. I anticipate that yeah. he's doing row by column, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, so I'm taking, ah, uh, for this first element, I'm taking the top row of the first matrix and multiplying it by, um, or basically taking like the first element in the top row of the first matrix, multiplying it by. Oh, so this one yeah. is zero and this thing is, is yep. zero. Yeah, and then you just take the sum of okay. both of those products. Okay. Um, and then likewise for the rest of the elements, I'm doing top row and the rightmost column, and then bottom row in the left column, and okay. bottom row in the right column. Yeah, so then this one, uh, we'll just give the um, uh, ho and ho, and then, because there's mm -hmm. a zero, mm -hmm. okay. and then, uh, yeah, this one we'll give ho lu. Oh, that's, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, so then the trace is just equal to D multiplied by um, by uh, this element uh -huh. and then this element. Okay.
Excellent. Let's applaud. So, uh, do you see a discovery that VJ just, just completed? I know I, I skipped several, uh, or just skimmed through several introductory steps, uh, but let's, let's look how to interpret his, his results. So, we claim that it is expectation value of transition dipole. And uh, it's fine to have the vectors here. This will be matrix element. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. So the expectation value of transition dipole does depend only on the transition density elements. So here we started with maybe non zero elements of occupied and unoccupied. But they do not contribute to the value of transition type. So, for the practical purposes of computing the absorption spectrum, we even do not need to know the uh, correction to unoccupied orbitals. We need only transition densities because the only only elements of uh, transition density segments of overall, overall density matrix contribute to expectation value of transition dipole. I was able to do it. <laughs> so let's let's let me verbalize it. Uh, from transition density. Determines transition type. T, D, D, T, D. T transition <laughs> density determines transition type. Right? So if you do know transition density, you know transition depth. And uh, you also you already know the transition energies. So you have all input information to compute spectrum. Right? And your transition dipole enters the oscillator strength uh, times uh, I don't remember what is on the next slide, but it will be very reasonable to rewrite once again favorite equation at home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is old fashioned. This is uh, <coughs> what, what we do with uh, VASP and independent orbital approximation. But if we run TDDFT instead of two indices, we have one I capital, one I capital for slider strengths, and one uh, transition energy for, for this for here, right? And uh, these guys are borrowed from the output of TDDFT calculation. When we meet on Wednesday, the primary goal will be to catch up on the project. But if time allows, it would be very reasonable academically to illustrate quickly running something on TDDFT and analyzing or just looking, getting familiar with extracting these two uh, columns of, of, uh, of data from, from its output. Some fraction of class will be aware of this procedure. Uh, now it would be reasonable either to summarize it or maybe to finish. Okay. So comparison of orbital picture and accident picture. In orbital picture you have two indices everywhere. And accident picture, you have one index everywhere, right? But you can run it for the same systems. And if the electron electron interaction is not as critical for systems, if the uh, electrons holes are 
almost independent unbound, this spectra would coincide. The benefit of the excitonic picture that it is much more reliable and uh, accurate, it is critically needed <laughs> if there is a formation of bound excitons for um, molecules, conjugated polymers, and uh, pairs, oh, limitations. Um, how many excited states can you run in TDDT if you, if you practice? Maximum number of excited states that you did run. I don't know. I know it was like 125. 125. Excellent. Around 70. 70. Okay. Um, what is the number of excited states you can do with uh, this approximate method? Actually, we, we do it all the time. You, uh, in, the, um, in the file input overlap, you tell like use orbitals from 1 to, let's say, 200, with HOMO being about 100. So 100 occupied, 100 unoccupied. And you use all, all the pairs, all combinations. 100 times 100 equals 10,000. 10,000 10, excited states. And you do it in like uh, a million, right? So uh, amount of excited states and range of energies to be covered by the independent orbital approximation is uh, like a couple of orders of magnitude bigger than you can do with TDMT. If you will not scale, you will not scale and will fail if you request uh, 10,000. So it's uh, your creative balancing of, of these two approaches based on, on your needs. So if your system is huge, there is no chance to do TDFT. If it is small and you need to defend that you've computed everything precisely, TDFT is your friend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for staying. I will stay here a little longer if you need to answer questions. And um, I anticipate that Christian may, may have a quick question. I do. I do. <laughs> is that it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. If I if I do have a question, it's not a question. <laughs> uh, my brain my brain's fried today. <laughs> <laughs>